introduction, and thank you, Anna, for inviting me. Um, I live pretty pretty locally, uh, but I'm not from here originally. And I thought hard about what to talk about here because it's it's boundless what I could talk about. And I thought um, hard about should I lecture about something, um, do something practical, something esoteric and academic. And so I decided to talk about something in between, and it really relates to how I live my daily life with poetry. Um, you know, I'm, I'm no longer the kind of writer that wakes up every morning and sits down and starts writing, mostly due to family and work obligations, but I've come to peace with that, and, and now I read and sort of live a, as a writer in the real world, I guess. Um, and in the process, how I stay kind of inspired by poetry is to read a lot of poetry whenever I can. And, and so in the process of leaving the university setting and you know having a job and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, going to soccer games and selling Girl Scout cookies and all those kind of things, I've discovered that poems are actually my teachers. Um, and so when you leave here, if you continue to live a life filled with poetry, you'll no longer have amazing teachers that you have here. No one's going to tell you what poems to read or give you assignments and teach you about the craft or the art. And you're going to have to do that on your own. And, um, and so for me, that's, that was a hard transition. And so po poems, and they still are every day my, my best teachers. And so I thought I would talk about some of the poems that I still return to, both old and new, that continue to teach me things um, or make me think about my poems in different ways. Or when I just feel like something is missing in my life, I just go and read something and then I all of a sudden kind of awaken. You know, in the same way that I, you walk into this interfaith chapel and you look up and it's just for a moment you're kind of in a different place. And that's what poetry does for me. Um, so I thought I'd kind of split up and talk about different craft elements or areas. And for inspiration, just general inspiration, um, I, I go to a, a very famous poem by Wall Stevens called Disillusionment of 10 O'Clock, and most of you probably already know that. Um, and I'll just read a quote by E.B. White. Quote, a poet dares to be just so clear and no clearer. He approaches lucid ground warily, like a mariner who is determined not to scrape his bottom on anything solid. And when I think about that quote, I think that's what a writer is trying to do all the time. So um, I'll, I just wanted to read it again, and I'll read some of the poems I talk about here. This, this is by Wall Stevens, Disillusionment at 10 o'clock. The houses are haunted by white nightgowns. None are green, or purple with green rings, or green with yellow rings, or yellow with blue rings, None of them are strange with socks of lace and beaded censures. People are not going to dream of baboons and periwinkles. Only here and there, an old sailor, drunk and asleep in his boots, catches tigers in red weather. And when I'm feeling kind of unimaginative, and I, I feel like I need to go against the grain, I turn to that poem for, for whatever reason over and over again. And I love the brevity and the tightness of that poem and the way it moves at the end. You know, the lines get shorter and shorter and more and more rhythmic with the last few lines of catches tigers in red weather. You can hear it, you know, the trochaic tetrameter. And, you know, I love what the poem says, which is sort of a guiding light for me, which is, you know, it's against the safe, the boring, the conventional. And I think that, for me, has become very inspirational. Um, when I'm struggling with image, which I think is a big part of poetry, I turn to this poet, I don't know if you know this poet, um, his name is Thomas Transtromer. Um, I don't see any nods. But um, <laughs> he just, I think he may have just passed away recently, and um, I think he's a Swedish poet, if I'm not, if I'm correct. But um, I'm going to read a quote here, too, um, to talk about image, and this is also a quote by Wall Stevens. Quote, imagination applied to the whole world is vapid in comparison to imagination applied to a detail. And so when I think about writing poems, I think about the small images that you need to focus on. Um, and I turn to Thomas Tranströmer, and I'm not going to read any of his poems because there are so many, but what I love about his images um, is that they always mean more, they're weighty, and they have a higher purpose. 
and it goes much beyond just simply describing something. And the images are so arresting because Transformer is a, it's a poet with much larger concern. And so I just plucked out a bunch of my favorite lines, and they're just really, he just views things so differently and takes the everyday and comes up with these really incredible images. In a poem called Lamento, he says, Moths settle down on the pain, small pale telegrams from the world. He calls a newspaper a dirty butterfly, which I thought was really interesting. Um, another poem, The Tree and the Sky, he says, as soon as the rain stops, the tree stops too. It simply stands motionless in the clear nights, waiting just as we do for that moment when snowflakes throw themselves out in space. Um, in, in the open window, he says, I didn't know which way to turn my head. My sight was divided like a horse's. In Breathing Space July, he says, or writes, the man who spends the whole day in an open boat moving over the luminous bays will fall asleep at last inside the shade of his blue lamp as the islands crawl like huge moths over the globe. And I'll read one, one more from him. Um, a winter night. A more serious storm is moving over us all. It puts its lips to our soul and blows to make a sound. We're afraid the storm will blow everything inside us away. So you should read him. I mean, um, it's translated work, but yeah, it's just, it's beautiful. And, and every time I, I'm struggling with images in my own poems, I go look there and think, wow, I, I should try and do that more and more. Um, and again, I think the thing about his images that make them so resting in the end is not just that he transforms something so ordinary to something so different, but it's so much more. He reaches, he's, his poems are going for something so much more. And so when I think about syntax and rhythm and repetition and I'm struggling with how to write poems that play with syntax differently or rhythm differently, um, I look to a newer poet, his name is Shane McRae. Um, and actually I'll read a quote first about syntax. This is a quote by Douglas Copeland, a Canadian writer and artist. He said, quote, English is flexible. You can jam it into a Cuisinart for an hour remove it, and meaning will still emerge. <laughs> and that's kind of what Shane McRae does with his work. Um, he published a book a few years back called Mule by Cleveland. It was published by Cleveland State University Press. And this is the first book that I've, I've seen in a while that I was truly excited about. Um, his syntax is unusual, it's choppy, it's disruptive, and it oftentimes mirrors his subject of divorce, dislocation, and in his newer poems that are not in his current book, Mule, um, it's, it's very violent, you know, he talks about rape and all these other things for whatever reason poets seem to gravitate towards, sometimes gravitate towards these darker, um, darker, darker subjects. And in his own words he wrote, I don't write free, free verse poems mostly because I can't, but I'm interested in the musical effects achievable with free verse. My attempt to create a meter that is simultaneously formal and free and to think for musical purposes at the level of the verse paragraph rather than the line. So I'll just read um, one of his poems, and you'll hear it. And he does this interesting thing where he puts little dashes in there. But this poem is called In No Place. It's kind of hard to read, but I'll, I'll give it a try. In No Place. And we divorced in any, anyhow, but sudden, anyhow. But hurry, we divorced in sudden, hurry the fair. Become the main thing, don't want to be mere read, still become the main thing anyhow. Already sit and don't go out, in any sudden every sudden thing, and we, in any hurry, turn to salt and break. The farther I run far from you, the less I feel my own body, and turn to salt and break and hurry, have to get back now, home to Chicago, every sudden thing marries already, there's no money left, and we divorced in anyhow, the eyes, except the eyes, eyes turn to limestone in their sockets, and the eyes go also numb, 
and any hurry hurries home. And once I had a lover, and a lover, and a fine lover, I had a lover, and she was mine, as lost as sudden, suddenly. The woods behind my house are trees in no place. Every time I touch you, I feel less of my own body, fingertips and wrists, elbows and shoulders, strange to feel the numbness as a tingling, as an extra burst of life to signal something dying. Hurry, the fair become the main thing. Hurry, any, anyhow, become your home. Is anyhow your home? And have you ever had another and wandered through the woods and made the forts made of stripped trees my forts? As sure as my body is mine, as sure, the trees would either way bend but to strip them first. And I'll skip to the end. And that is how I look for you, bend but to strip them, ladders hanging from the trees, but first we had to choose the tree and clear the hives from the tree, but first we had to climb. So that's different, right? Um, when I first read that, I thought, nobody sounds like that. And what he has done with syntax is just so interesting to me. Um, it made me think much more openly about my own work and how you don't have to make a sentence sound like a sentence. There's no such thing as um, a rule. You know, you can learn all of the rules, but then you can break all of them. And so that's what I love about his poems and that whole book, and it's called Mule, and you should definitely check it out. His name is Shane McRae. Um, so when I'm thinking about writing about, I think poets like to write about themselves and the things that they're thinking about and the concerns that that we have and our perceptions and the things that happen in our lives. And um, But I've always tried to think beyond myself and my own writing. And that's important to me because um, it just is. It's, it's, I, you know, I think that what I think about and what happens to me is important, of course, but I want to make that much broader. And so when I'm struggling with going beyond myself and thinking about philosophy or science or math or society, um, you know, I think about a poet named Ben Lerner and um, his book, Angle of Yaw, which was published by Copper Canyon Press. Um, and here's a quote, actually, not from his book, but just a general quote by, by Plato. Quote, poetry is nearer to vital truth than history. And so then I, that's kind of what makes me think that, you know, if you're just going to talk about your own personal history or the history of anything or something that happened to you, um, and you're going to do it in the form of poetry, there's something more vital to it. There's more truth to it. There's something deeper to it than just saying, I dated this person, we broke up, and I'm sad. So there's got to be something you know, much bigger, bigger than that. And so um, this book, Angle of Yaw, published by Copper Canyon Press, um, is amazing. Uh, it's this entire book of prose poems. It's like this thick, and there are all these little poems that look like this, and the little rectangles. And um, what I love about this book is that his diction is really flat and theoretical. He's pensive, but he's actually really funny, too. And there's a sort of meditative philosophical intelligence that I love about it. And it's a thinking person's book. Um, but there's also humor in it. And um, I'm going to read just one short poem. And they look like this, all of them. <laughs> and there's a ton of them. Reading is important because it makes you look down, an expression of shame. When the page is shifted to a vertical plane, it becomes an advertisement, decree, and or image of a missing pet or child. We say that texts displayed vertically are addressed to the public, while in fact, by failing to teach us the humi humility a common life requires, they convene a narcissistic mass. When you window shop, when you shatter a store window, you see your own image in the glass. I'll have one more, I'll read one more. And there's no titles. If it hangs from the wall, it's a painting. If it rests on the floor, it's a sculpture. If it's very big or very small, it's conceptual. If it forms part of the wall, if it forms part of the floor, it's architecture. If you have to buy a ticket, it's modern. If you're already inside it and you have to pay to get out of it, it's more modern. If you can be inside it without paying, it's a trap. If it moves, it's outmoded. If you have to look up, it's religious. If you have to look down, it's realistic. If it's been sold, it's site-specific. If, in order to see it, you have to pass through a metal detector, it's public. 
<laughs> so all of them are like that. I mean, when I read that book, I started doing the little earmark that I do when I like poems, and the whole thing is earmarked. <laughs> I mean, in every poem, there's something, wow, that's really, that's really intelligent. So anyway, he's a great person, too. I met him once, and I thought, smart, smart person. You can just tell. Um, and so when I'm thinking about voice, tone, and persona, um, you know, it's always fine to get out of yourself. And sometimes I write persona poems and um, write in a different voice. Um, I look to a poem poet, which a lot of you probably know. Her name is Louise Glick, and her groundbreaking book, The Wild Iris. Um, and on voice, tone, and persona, here's a quote from Michael Andachi from The English Patient. Quote, Quite early on, I had discovered the overlooked space open to those of us with a silent life. I didn't argue with a policeman who said I couldn't cycle over a certain bridge or through a specific gate in the fort. I just stood there, still, until I was invisible, and then I went through, like a cricket, like a hidden cup of water. So, um, as you know, many of you probably, the, uh, the book is a sequence, Louise Glick's book is a sequence of poems that are spoken in the voices of flowers, and it's a dialogue between the flowers and the gardener, or the poet, and through the unnamed God. And it's still one of my favorite books of all time. Um, and the thing I love about these poems is how much attitude they have, and how the group of poems works so well as a collection. Um, I should warn you, I have this smoker's cough, though I'm not a smoker, so. <coughs> It's like this lung problem I have, so if you shake my hand, I'm not, I'm not actually sick. It's just a perpetual cough. <laughs> if you do get sick, don't blame it on me. <laughs> but in her poems, um, tone overtakes or replaces image, and metaphor replaces image. Um, and I'll read just, I'm sure you all know this, but um, I'm going to read um, one of my favorite poems from the book. It's called Witchgrass. Witchgrass. And these are in the voice of witchgrass. Something comes into the world unwelcome, calling disorder, disorder. If you hate me so much, don't bother to give me a name. Do you need one more slur in your language, another way to blame one tribe for everything? As we both know, if you worship one god, you only need one enemy. I'm not the enemy, only a ruse to ignore what you see happening right here in this bed, a little paradigm of failure. One of your precious flowers dies here almost every day, and you can't rest until you attack the cause, meaning whatever is left, whatever happens to be sturdier than your personal passion. It was not meant to last forever in the real world, but why admit that when you can go on doing what you always do, mourning and laying blame, always the two together? I don't need your praise to survive. I was here first, before you were here, before you ever planted a garden, and I'll be here when only the sun and moon are left and the sea and the wide field. I will constitute the field. And again, you know, what I love about these poems is the attitude and the cleverness and the wit and the bitterness and kind of being unashamed of that and then using an entirely different construct to get that voice across. And you know, if it wasn't, if they weren't poems in the, in the voice of um, plants and weeds, it just sounded like an angry sort of bitter person. And I thought it was brilliant what she did to sort of channel her um, feelings through these these flowers and plants, um, and I think they're just really surprising in their causticness. So I always look to that, and she gives me courage to sort of say whatever I feel like saying, and not be afraid at what other people might think. Um, and so that's why I turn to for voice, tone, and persona. And I think poetry, even though lyric poetry is not necessarily you know, a lot of storytelling. And I'm not a traditional kind of narrative storyteller by any means. Um, I think all the poems, all poems do end up telling a story, even lyric poems that are mysterious. There can be elements of storytelling, however mysterious they might be. And just because I don't necessarily favor narrative poems myself, I still feel like I have a lot to learn from them. And so when I think of the best story poems, um, I think of Carolyn Forche's famous poem, The Colonel, or Robert Haas's prose poems, A Story About the Body, and Bridget P. Jean Kelly's song, um, Kelly's poem, Song, which I will read. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and before I read her poem, here's a quote from Wittgenstein in his notebooks. Quote, Think how after Schubert's death, his brother cut certain of Schubert's scores into small pieces, 
and gave to his favorite pupils these pieces of a few bars each. Now, I might have to skip through some of it because it's long. Um, <coughs> song. And her name is Bridget Pigeon Kelly, and her poems are amazing. Um, listen. There was a goat's head hanging by ropes in a tree. All night it hung there and sang, and those who heard it felt it hurt, felt a hurt in their hearts and thought they were hearing the song of a night bird. They sat up in their beds, and then they lay back down again. In the night wind, the goat's head swayed back and forth, and from afar off it shone faintly, the way the moonlight shone on a train track miles away beside which the goat's headless body lay. Some boys had hacked his head off. It was harder work than they had imagined. The goat cried like a man and struggled hard, but they finished the job. They hung the bleeding head by the school and then ran off into the darkness that seems to hide everything. The head hung in the tree, the body lay by the tracks. The head called to the body, the body to the head. They missed each other. The missing grew large between them until it pulled the heart right out of the body, until the drawn heart flew toward the head, flew as a bird flies back to its cage and the familiar perch from which it trills. Then the heart sang in the head, softly at first, and then louder. And I'm gonna skip down a little bit. Um, and then there was a girl. The girl lived near a high railroad track. At night she heard the trains passing, the sweet sound of the train's horn, pouring softly over her bed. And each morning she woke to give the bleeding goat his pail of warm milk. She sang him songs about girls with ropes and cooks in boats. She brushed him with a stiff brush. She dreamed daily that he grew bigger, and he did. She thought her dreaming made it so. But one night, the girl didn't hear the train's horn, and the next morning, she woke to an empty yard. The goat was gone. Everything looked strange. It was as if a storm had passed through while she slept, wind and stones, rain stripping the branches of fruit. She knew that someone had stolen the goat and that he had come to harm. She called to him all morning and into the afternoon. She called and called. She walked and walked in her chest a bad feeling, like the feeling of the stones gouging the soft undersides of her bare feet. Then somebody found the goat's body by the high tracks, the flies already filling their soft bottles at the goat's torn neck. Then somebody found the head hanging in a tree by the school. They hurried to take these things away so that the girl would not see them. They hurried to raise money to buy the girl another goat. They hurried to find the boys who had done this, to hear them um, say it was a joke, a joke, it was nothing but a joke. But listen, here is the point. The boys thought to have their fun and be done with it. It was harder work than they had imagined, this silly sacrifice, but they finished the job, whistling as they washed their hands, large hands in the dark. What they didn't know was that the goat's head was already singing behind them in the tree. What they didn't know was that the goat's head would go on singing just for them, long after the ropes were down, and that they would learn to listen, pal after pal, stroke after patient stroke. They would wake in the night, thinking they heard the wind in the trees, or a night bird, but their hearts beating harder. There would be a whistle, a hum, a high murmur, and at last a song, the low song a lost boy sings, remembering his mother's call. Not a cruel song, no, no, not a cruel song at all. This song is sweet, it is sweet. The heart dies of this sweetness. Oh, thank you. I know. Actually, I haven't had a coughing fit yet. They're really bad. Um, so the last thing um, that, that I want to talk about is something that I had trouble kind of thinking of what to name it. And so I just called it psychology. And um, basically, when I read poetry, or anything actually, fiction, nonfiction, anything, um, when, I get, when I get excited and something really moves me, that makes me feel something that I can't really articulate. You know, the kind of poetry that reaches to some sort of psychological depth. You know, I think of the longest root in an oldest tree that just goes down into the earth farther than other roots can or are willing to. Um, that's what I'm looking for when I'm reading. And that's what I'm trying to find um, or always seeking for in my, my own writing. Um, so here's a quote from Picasso on what I kind of call psychology. Quote, Art is a form of magic designed as a mediator between this strange, hostile world and us, 
a way of seizing the power by giving form to our terrors as well as our desires. And when I'm looking for these kinds of poems, I recently came across a poet who um, is a local poet and also happens to teach here, is Alison Venice White, and her book, um, Self Portrait and Crayon. And what I love about this book is how it goes back and forth between Degas and the personal self portrait, the self story, but it never really touches anything. I mean, it really is a book that just floats and never grounds itself. And the results are simultaneously oblique, moving, and, and haunting. Um, and that haunting, I think, is what I'm drawn to um, in her entire book about not, well, it's about things, but it's really not about anything. And that's, that's what I love about it. Um, her, um, her first poem in this book, I'll just read this thing. I don't know if any of you know her work. I imagine many of you do. Um, it's called from Degas' sketchbook, and I'll just read this. And her mother, the backstory is that her mother disappeared for a while when she was a child. The hidden are alone too. I crouched in the closet between my mother's skirts and shoes where the legs should be. Whether I was quiet or not, I would be found. It was an obvious place, her clothes and shoes. I only have to say it once. I don't say anything because the game requires silence. This is an external narrative when I was small. It would be easier to fold in half or not say anything. People lose their minds and leave in the middle of cooking salmon. I will tell you something quietly. We tried to send her a birthday card, but it was returned, wrong address. It is common to know very little, if anything. The point is to stay calm, to be found before you disappear. Not blank or colored in yet, but the outline of upturned hands and a quick circle or a mouth. Sometimes the face is so specific that the body is just penciled lightly in. It would be easier to finish here before the tenderness of the figure is gone and the silk of the slip sewn inside my skirt as I sat carefully in the dark. It is so close to being skin. People exist for as long as possible until it is too difficult to matter. The shoulders are the span of the hanger and the mind is the hook which suspends the entire dress. I just love those poems. Um, so anyway, those are the main categories that categories, it sounds so formal, but those are the types of things that I think about when I'm stuck writing my own um, poems or when I'm just frustrated with writing because writing is a very difficult um, process and you know, even with computers and all this technology, <coughs> typing is easier than writing, and, but you still, it has to come from somewhere else and for me, as I said before, um, you know, there's so many poems out there and fiction and nonfiction, um, newspapers, anything that you read can, in the future, in some sort of way, um, become your teacher when you leave here. Because, in essence, you're kind of here and then you leave and then you're on your own and you have to find your own teachers. And to me, that's always going to be other people's writing. And, um, and sometimes, even my own writing, I look back and think, oh, what did I write that for? And why? What was I thinking? And how did I come up with that particular image? Um, but anyway, I just want to thank you.